Welcome back. We're on Lab 4, Distributions 2, and the reading for this is from Voking Allen, Chapter 16, where we're talking a lot about, about uh, probability. And so we're going to do some basic probability stuff here and also continue to think about creating and manipulating uh, distributions in R. So this is uh, distributions in a more basic way, starting to think about um, probability and getting a feel for that using R. We're going to have three concepts. Concept one is probabilistic event generation. And then we've got experiencing probability. And finally, subjective probability and some different generalization assignments. So let's get on with concept one. So in this section, we're going to be using R to generate events in probabilistic ways. We're going to look at some dice problems and then uh, use the sample function to generate different kinds of events uh, beyond dice problems. I'm going to switch over to our studio here and let's take a look. So we're going to use the sample function throughout all of this as a way to generate events with specified probabilities. And uh, in these concept sections, we're basically going to introduce a kind of toy problem, and then we'll think about how to do it in R. So here's our first toy problem. We've got some dice. Well, in this case, we've got a single die. So we're going to use R to roll a fair six-sided six die and show that each number comes up equally frequently in the long run. Uh, okay, so let's roll the dice 10,000 times, which is a good long run of rolling the die, or I guess I should say die, and report how many times each number, 1 to 6, was rolled. And uh, if we do this correctly, we should find that each one happens uh, roughly equally frequently. That is, if we rolled our dice a bunch of times, we should get about the same number for each of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. We can easily do this using the sample function. Remember, our sample function takes an input vector. This, this one is, has, has the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we're saying sample from this 10,000 times, and we're going to set replacement to true. So every time we take out one of these values, we replace the value so it can be potentially sampled again. And by default, each of the particular possible numbers will be sampled with equal probability. So I'm going to place that into a roles variable. We could look at it. It's got a whole bunch of numbers, 10,000 dice rolls. So this is pretty cool. We've simulated the process of rolling a single die 10,000 times. Now, if we take 10,000 and divide by six, we see that uh, it divides into six, 1,666.66 repeating times. So this is roughly how many times each number should be rolled. So how can we evaluate our vector of rolls and count how many times each number occurred. There's a convenient function called table for this, and it's right here. It uses the cross-classifying factors to build a contingency table of the counts at each combination of factor levels. Well, if we put in a vector that contains unique values, it will count them all up for us, just like this. So there's six unique values that occur in rolls, and here are the counts for each of them. And as you can see, they're all pretty close to 1,666, but they're not exactly this number. Um, so there's some variability in the random sampling process. Okay, number two. With a pair of six-sided dice, it is possible to roll the numbers 2 to 12. Use a simulation of 10,000 rolls of a pair of dice in R to calculate the probability of rolling each of the possible numbers. 
or just an aside there, I've illustrated some of the ways you can combine the numbers from two die to create a final value. So you could roll a one and a one, and that's how you get a two. You could roll a one and a two, and you get a three, and so on, until you could roll a six and a five to get an 11, or a six and a six to get a 12. So there's all these different ways you could roll in the middle and get the numbers from two to 12. So let's calculate the probability of rolling each of those numbers using a simulation. First thing we're gonna do is sample 10,000 rolls for a single die. And I'll do that here, put this into the variable one to uh, indicate our, our first die that we're rolling. So that would be the rolls on this one, I guess. And then we need to get and roll another one 10,000 times. So now we've got two of those. And we could add them together simply by going one plus two here. And we're going to now add up our rolls. So for example, if we just look at the first 10 numbers in one, so these are the first 10 rolls of that die. Here are the next 10 rolls, or here are the 10 rolls of the other die. And if we add these together, then uh, we can get, so four plus two is six, six plus five is 11, six plus five is 11. So we rolled here, I guess, a six, 11, 11, 11, six, five, 12, six, eight, 10. Those are the first 10 rolls. Combined is the variable now that saves all of the rolls, the sum of all of the rolls, 10, all 10,000 of them. Now we know that if we use table and put in the combined variable, we will count up all of the unique uh, entries in the variable combined. So if we do that, we're going to see how many times each of the numbers was rolled out of 10,000. If we want to get the probabilities, or in this case, the observed proportions, we could divide by 10,000, which is the total number of rolls. And when we do that, we see these, we see our different observed proportions here. And we can see that the number seven is the number that has the highest probability of being rolled. And that is because there's more ways that you can get to seven than any of the other numbers. Uh, so one, one thing we've done is we've just rolled two pretend dice for 10,000 times. And we've estimated the probabilities that each of the outcomes could occur. So let's compare the result of that to the known probabilities. So what are the known probabilities? What is the true probability of rolling a two or rolling a three or so on? Well, uh, we need to find out how many ways we can achieve each outcome and then divide those by the total number of possible outcomes. Now, I'm going to do this in R in a particular way. First of all, I'm going to say that uh, the first dice all right, so I've set up a vector uh, where we have each of the possible values six times. This represents uh, how I'm gonna think about combining all the possible outcomes. So I know that the first dice could be a one, for example, like this, and the second dice could be a one. That's also that the first dice could be a one, the second one could be a two, and so on. I'm going to run out of room here. And, and so if the, for each value of the first die, there's six possible values on the second die. And we can do this for two. And so on. So we're making these little groups. So there's six possible things six possible pairs here, there's six possible pairs here. If we kept going, we, we can, I think, figure out that there's going to be a total of uh, six times six or 36 possible combinations of, or 36 possible pairs. And what I'm trying to do in R is create these numbers. 
th these pairs of numbers. So for example, for the first six ones, I want to create in the second variable the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six. And then for the next set of twos, I want to again have the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six. So I can achieve this using the rep function in different ways. So in the second variable, we have the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six. And oh, that needs to be repeated six times, doesn't it? Just like that. Okay, so in the first one, we repeat each number six times, and in the second one, we repeat this sequence one to six, six times. So we get again, the first one looks like that, the second one looks like this. And uh, these represent all of the possible ways of combining a first and second dice roll. So if we were to add these up, we would find out all of the different ways we could produce the sums. So I'm just going to do that here, add them up. So now we're looking at sum underscore rolls. And if we just kind of look at this, we can see, yeah, the first way, that's when the two ones line up right here. This is the only way that we can get a two. Similarly, there's only one way we can get a 12. That's when the sixes line up. Uh, but there's more than one way we could get a three. And if we just look at this, there's two ways because we could get a one, two or a two, one. And there's three ways we could get a four and so on. So it turns out the number with the most ways is seven. And what I'd like to do is count how many ways I can get each of these numbers. So I need to count up the occurrences of each of the values in here. And we can do that using table, which we've been using throughout this lab. All right, so now we can see that there's one way to get a two, two ways to get a three, three ways to get a four, four ways to get a five, and so on. There's six ways to get a seven. And that's the most ways that you could get any of the possible outcomes. So if we want to get the probabilities of these things, what we need to do is divide each of these numbers by the total number of possible outcomes. And that is the total number of values in the sum roles variable. And we already talked about that, that there was 36 possible ways of getting uh, of combining two rolls or two die. So if we just divide these things, we're going to see the um, probabilities of getting any of the given numbers. And if we wanted to compare our simulation result from up here, so these are the estimated numbers with the actual numbers, we could do, uh, I'm just going to do this again, and I'm going to run this. So what we're doing here is we're saving the values from our simulation in a variable called sim result, and we're saving the values from our uh, calculation, direct calculation of the probabilities in this variable, and we're simply taking the difference. And if our simulation did a good job of estimating, we should expect the difference to be small in each of these cases that is close to zero, small number. And as you can see, these are pretty small numbers. If we were to increase the number of dice rolls, we'd do even better at estimating these things. If we were to decrease, so if, let's just quickly only roll these things 100 times and divide by 100, we'll get some s probabilities. And let's do this again. But now you can see that we're still close to zero. Um, oops, this one here is what we want to look at. We're still close to zero, but some of the values like 0 0.04, we're not truly very small values. If I was to take this up to say a million, so there we go, there's a million. So we're gonna roll the dice a million times. We're going to 
get some estimates. Let's do a million here. And we should see some values that are really, really small, and that's what we're seeing here. So these are using scientific notation, so this means there's five zeros in front of this value, and there's four zeros in front of this value, so their values are getting smaller and smaller and closer to true zero. I'm gonna set that back to 1,000, and we'll move on. Okay, we're going to now use sample to generate a few other kinds of things besides numbers and to remind ourselves that with this function we can designate particular probabilities uh, for events to occur. So in this example we're going to sample from the vector containing an A or a B. We're going to sample from it 20 times. We're going to set replace equals true because there's only two things. We have to put them back in in order to sample 20 times we're going to set the probability of the first element, that is an A, to a 0.8, and a probability of the second element to a 0.2. So we can do things like this as well. And now we're going to fool around with generating letters. One of the problems down the road here in Lab 4 is going to be to generate pretend words using the probabilities of letter occurrences in English. But to get there, we'll do some of these examples. Let's talk about generating letters from the alphabet such that each letter could occur with equal probability. And let's generate 50 letters. It's convenient that R actually has built-in variables. One of them is called letters. And if you type this into the console, you generate all of the letters in the alphabet in lowercase. And if you do it in uppercase, you get all the uppercase letters. Of, uh, that is a vector of those things. So if, if we wanted to sample 50 random letters, we could simply put the letters vector inside the sample function, ask for 50, set replace to true, and there we would have 50 random letters. All right. Well, let's go into a few more funny things that they have to do with exploring the probabilities of things, but also a little bit of uh, details in R having to do with controlling and manipulating the output of some simulation. So consider this problem. Create a random string generator where a string is any combination of letters, let's say. So there's a five letter string. So generate um, a string of five random letters, uh, but, oh, sorry, generate 50 random letter strings, each with five random letters in it. Uh, let's try it out. So we're going to sample from the letters vector. We're going to need 50 times five letters and we're going to set replace to true. So now we have these letters, but look at how they're organized, just like this. We would need to find some way to split these up into units of five. Now there's probably a whole bunch of ways we can do that. I'm going to introduce some new commands that are convenient for doing this, uh, for this particular problem. So there's something called a matrix object. Rather, it's like a data frame. It's, it stores information in a table, in a two-dimensional table. Um, but generally, it's used to store numbers. So a matrix would be having rows and columns, just like this. Before I show you what happens when I run this command, I'm going to show you an example of creating a matrix. I'm going to create a matrix of ones with five columns and five rows. And there we have it. We've got 
five, we've got ones everywhere, we've got five columns and five rows. It turns out we can put, so what is five times five? It's 25, right? So there's 25 values in here. So if I said one to 25, check this out, it's going to put those values in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And it's actually going to put them down the column just this way. There is an option to control that. If we set by row equals true, it will put them in this way. In fact, it will put in things, whatever is in here, it will do. So if we had, let's say we had, um, the letter A 25 times, we could put the letter A in there 25 times. Well, let's say we had um, a vector called my letters and it had 250 things in it. And we wanted to have them shaped into S chunks of five things. Well, if we used the matrix function just like this, we create a matrix with 50 rows in it and five columns in it. And we place our random letters that we sampled into each of the uh, squares or slots in the matrix. So this could be our first random letter string, Z, N, P, C, S. And this could be the next one, F, C, E, C, V. So now I've got another problem. And that is all of my strings are in this matrix. The indexing of a matrix is like a data frame. So you can use the square brackets. And if you want to look at the first row, you put a one followed by a comma and you get the first row. Oops, I need to call it my strings. So there's the first row. There's the second row. There's the third row. And instead of having these things uh, be inside different elements of a vector, for example, I would like to print them out as a single string. So I, I want them to appear like this, not individually like they currently are appearing like this. Oops. Turns out there is something you can use to collapse the elements of a vector. And we can use the paste function for this. So the paste function, I'll just give you an example down here of using, let's take the numbers one to five and put them in the paste function and set the collapse argument to nothing. So what I've done here is I put two quotations and see what happens. So it collapses the numbers one to five into a string that is a character type, and it puts nothing in between the elements. With collapse, you can actually put other things inside the quotes. For example, if we wanted to separate those values with a comma, we could collapse with the comma or separate them with a whatever we want. In this case, we don't want anything to be separating the numbers, so we put nothing in between the quotes. Similarly, with the contents of my strings, let's take the first row of that matrix. If we put it in paste, we'll paste those letters together that um, exist in across the rows, or sorry, across the columns and we'll turn it into a string. Okay, so I'd like to do this for each of the 50 rows of the matrix. So I've created a storage variable called random underscore strings, and I'm going to make a loop, and I'm going to repeat for each row in the matrix. Now, how many rows are in the matrix? Well, we could use the dim function to find that out and that is short for dimensions. And it tells us there are 50 rows 
and five columns. It's always row, column, row first, then column, row, column. I always forget which one is which, but you know, maybe you'll remember one day. I, I guess I remember, but it took a while. So the first number is the row. So that means if I say dim my strings, I actually produce a vector of two things in it. And I want the first thing or the number in the first thing, because I want to make a number that goes from one to the, or I want to make a sequence of numbers that goes from one to the number of rows. So this creates the sequence one to 50 for me. That means I will be the values one to 50. And I can then for each value of i, for example, when i is 1, I can paste the letters in row 1 together and store them into position 1 of my random strings vector. And then when i is 2, I can do that to the second row and so on. And when I complete this, um, we will get a vector of strings and each of the letters in these strings have been randomly selected. And that concludes our first concept section. We've used R as a, uh, as a, as a machine to generate events, different kinds of events, dice rolls, letter generation with different kinds of probabilities. In concept two, we're going to talk about experiencing probability. For me, the more I think about probabilities, the more they become quite strange. And um, for con yeah, basically that's how I'll put it, I find them quite strange. We use them all the time to talk about things in the world. We might say that tomorrow has a 10% chance of rain or that a fair coin has a 50% chance of landing heads or tails. And these are interesting statements, I think. We've already begun to look at how probabilities behave in our previous lab. We looked at coin flipping there, and we saw that uh, when a fair coin that is has a probability of getting heads of 50%, what does that mean? Well, it means that in the long run, you'll get 50% heads, but not necessarily in the short run. For example, here's the graph we made from the previous lab looking at the probability of getting a heads over the course of 1,000 flips. And you can see early on, uh, the probability isn't 50% every single time because you could get a bunch of heads or a bunch of tails and this thing gets... So for this example, actually, over the course of 1,000 flips, yeah, the, prob the overall proportion of heads is pretty close to 0.5, but it actually is always over. So this coin appears to be a little bit biased in favor of more heads. If it was perfectly unbiased, you might think that would be right on this red line. However, this variability is more reflective of the random sampling process involved in probabilities than the total probability itself. Because if we were to go on, looking at a thousand or ten thousand or a million more flips the expectation is that the proportion of heads would settle on 50 percent over the very long run and so when we talk about probabilities it's worth experiencing their variability and we're going to do that in R. So we're going to consider short run coin flipping. Here's our problem. We'll flip a fair coin 10 times. And if you were to flip a coin 10 times, there's a bunch of things that could happen. You could get 10 tails or zero heads, or you could get up to 10 heads or any combination in between. So these are the things that could happen when you flip a coin 10 times. Even a fair coin could do these things just by chance alone. So we're talking about a short run situation because there's only 10 flips. So even if the coin is fair, uh, we are aware that any of these things could happen by chance alone. 
So our question is to try to determine um, what the possible outcomes are and what the probability is for each of the outcomes. So what is the probability of getting zero heads out of 10? What is the probability of getting one heads out of 10 or two or three and so on? We're going to compute this by simulation in R. All right. It's not terribly difficult to do this. We're going to make use of something called the replicate function in order to repeatedly do this coin flipping. First of all, <clears throat> let me draw your attention to this part of the function. Our, so what I've set up here is a sample function. It's got a vector with a one and a zero in it. So we can sample from this vector. We're gonna pretend, or we're gonna assume that a one is a heads. We'll use that because it's easy to sum up this vector. So if I was to say how many heads happened here, I could sum this up and I could get a two and I would know that there was two out of 10 were heads. Um, we're gonna sample 10 times. We're gonna set replace to true. We don't have to set anything with the prob inputs because that will automatically make each of these outcomes equally likely. All right. So every time we do this, we're flipping a coin 10 times, right? Just like this. And as you can see, there's lots of different outcomes. I don't want to do this by hand, and I could do this using a for loop. However, rather than doing that, I'm going to use the replicate function. The replicate function allows us to replicate something like this whole function some amount of times. So I'm going to say, let's do this whole thing. Um, well, let's, let's just do it five times for now. Let's see what we get. All right. So what we have is uh, the results of five separate sets of 10. And in the first column, we see our first 10 coin flips. And in the second column, we see our second set of 10 coin flips. And in the third column, the third set of coin flips. And this is actually a result that's been stored in a matrix, in this case, a 10 rows by five columns matrix. And when we do it, uh, this way, with 10,000, what we're doing here, and it's going to be a lot of numbers to look at, and I'm not sure it's actually going to print them all. It's, yeah, it's, it's printed some of them. So here we have our first set of 10, our next set of 10, our third set of 10, and so on. And now we've got and done this. It's only going to print um, the first 50 columns. Oh, I, I press over. Now we're going to look at the next 50. And it goes all the way to 10,000. So there's 10,000 columns here. Now, it turns out that there's a function called call sums. And what that does is it sums up all of the values uh, in, a, in each column. So if we were to look at sim results, and let's just look at uh, so we want to look at rows 1 to 10, but let's look at columns 1 to 5. These are the very first five sets of coin flips. So if I was to sum all the way down this column, I would have to do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That would be a 6. And then this one would be 1, 2, 3. That would be a 3. So 6, 3, and then this one's another 6. This one's 2. This one's 4. So 6, 3, 6, 2, 4. Let's put that into the call sums function and see what we get. Oops, I spelled it wrong. So we got 63624. So that summed up the columns. Now I want to do that for all of the 10,000 columns. And now I, I did it. And the, the 
values are in the variable number of heads. So these are basically telling us, you know, if we tried this little game 10,000 times, these are the numbers of heads you would get out of 10. And these are all the different things that can happen. Oh, look, someone, we got a 10 heads, we got another 10. There's lots of things that can happen. Of course, we know that anything from zero to 10 can happen. Did we find any zeros? That shouldn't happen very often, but it happens a little bit. Uh, I don't see any just there, but we're only looking at the first thousand and it's hard to tell, right? By just kind of looking through these things. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the table function to count up how many times each of these outcomes occurred. And so out of 10,000, 10 of the sets had zero heads. 91 of the sets had one head. 431 had two and so on. So these are the observed counts of the outcomes. There was 10,000 total sets. So if we divide by 10,000, we get the probabilities of each of these things occurring. Uh, finally, I'll note there is an alternative solution, um, and there's many more, but we could use the binomial distribution sampling function, which we'll talk about more when we get to the binomial test later on. Here's an example where we do 10,000 sets. We s flip the coin 10 times for each of them and we set the probability of a one, 2.5. And then we basically get a similar kind of vector as we had before. Uh, the outcomes of the number of heads for each set of 10. And we could do the table divide by 10,000, we get these same values. Let's consider another kind of question. And this kind of question is, if you flipped a coin 10,000 times, you'd find many different kinds of short run sequences. So let's just take a look and say like, okay, I got heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, heads, tails, 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 heads. You know, that could be a sequence, right? And if we look in here, we can see we got a, a heads and a tails. That happens. That happens here. That happens over here. The HT sequence happens quite a bit. We could also get an HH sequence. That happens here. So that can happen. We can also get a TH and a TT. Those are the, and if we're only, if we're looking at a size two, those are the four things that can happen. And so in this question, we're asking, um, if we made a sequence that was 10,000 long, what is the probability of each of these four subsequences occurring? What's that? What are those probabilities? And we're going to find out that they have an equal probability. Now, this question could be extended, and we don't do this in the lab, but it's something for your consideration. So I'm just going to draw this out because um, it turns out that we could probably generalize this thing. If, if I'm just telling you right now that there's a 25% chance of each one of those things. Now, what if I showed you a sequence like this? H, 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 H. Uh, would you think that we have a fair coin going on here? Maybe not. But we'll find that this sequence actually will occur probably somewhere in a, in 10,000 times. And that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's only 10 in a row. And um, in our last example, we already found that that, uh, that happened 13 times um, in our last simulation. So long sequences can totally happen. They don't happen that often, but they can happen. Um, so it's, and it's, a, it's a funny thing to consider in that if you were to look at the short run, you might see a really long sequence of one of the outcomes. And uh, nevertheless, the true state of the world might be that uh, the, the coin would be unbiased. So these are kind of some weird 
slightly weird dualities about the probabilities. It's worth noting though that inside of a sequence of 10 things, uh, all of the other possible combinations will be happening too. And we, we saw that there's all sorts of different combinations here. All right, I'm getting off the track of, of the problem we set out to solve, which was to show that just for these H, 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 T, T, H, and T, T, that these subsequences occur with equal frequency. So let's figure that one out. Um, first of all, I'm going to use letters. So we're going to sample from the letters H and T. We're going to do this 10,000 times. Replace equals true. So what we've done here is we've just created a really long sequence of H's and T's. Now I want to interrogate this sequence and I want to go in and measure um, all of the subsequences and then count them. So the way I'm doing this, and so like for example, if I, uh, so let's, let's just say that we've got an H, then a T, then an H, then a T, then a T, then a T. Let's say that's our sequence. So our first subsequence is HT, that's this one. And then it's TH, that's this one. And then it's TT, or TH, sorry, H, HT, TH, oh, it's HT again. And then it's TT, and so on. So we're trying to create these combos and then count them up. All right. So I've created an empty variable called sequence where I'm going to store these combos together, ultimately. I'm going to start at the second position. That's this position where there's a T. I'm going to start at the second position of the sequence and go from there to the length of the total number of flips. So this is basically going to give us 2 to 10,000. You'll see why I'm starting at 2 in a moment. So what I'm going to say is, as we go through here, so I's going to start at 2, and I'm going to say, let's record the first element. I'm trying to get this H here. So I'm going to go into the flips vector, and I'm going to, remember this I is going to be a 2, so it's going to be 2 minus 1. So that would be element 1 of flips. That's going to get me that H. Actually, let's just walk through this and pretend that I is a 2, which is how it starts out. So flips, oh, and actually in our example, I'm just going to delete this because the numbers that we're working with are not the same as what I wrote on the screen. So let's look at flips and let's look at the first 10. So it's T, T, H, T, T, H, T, H, H, T. Great. Uh, so if we have I is 2, then flips I minus 1 is going to be T. So 2 minus 1 is 1. The first thing there is a T. So our first element will be a T. Remember, I starts out as 2. So that will be the second element in flips. And we're going to assign that to the second element. So now we have a first, first element of the sequence. And we have a second element, a T and a T, and I want to paste them together. If we use the paste zero function, it automatically just pastes those two things together. And I want to save those into the first position of my sequence variable. And because I starts off as a two, I subtract a one from it. So the first thing will be uh, the first position will be a 1. And there we go. We've stored a TT in sequence. Now, if we look at our flips, um, the next thing is a TH. So when I increments, I will be a 3. And this will be taking 3 minus 1, which is a 2. That'll be this T here. That'll go into the first element. This will be 3. 
So it'll get the third element. So now we're getting a th. And then sequence will store th, which is the second subsequence. So we've stored the first subsequence. And now this second one. And now we want to do, so this loop is going to do them all once we run the loop here. So we can take a look at the sequence and we'll see that we have all these T, 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 H, H, T, and so on. So these are all the different subsequences that happened. Our goal was to count how often each of them happen. So we did that with the table sequence, with the table function and divide by the number, the total number, which is 10,000. So the probability is supposed to be 25% if they all happen equally frequently. And uh, you can see we're pretty close to, to there right there. And, and this, uh, this scales up. So if we were just to quickly look at this and ask about not subsequences of length two, but what about subsequences of length three? So how many of those are there? Or you could have H, 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 T, T, H, and T, T. And of course you could have uh, a third H. So there's one, two, three, four possibilities. And the third thing could be a T, and there'd be four more of those possibilities. So there's a total of eight different ways that you can have three elements here. So if there's eight different ways, how uh, do each of those eight different ways, so one, two, three, four, and all the other four ones, are, did those happen with equal probability? Uh, let's just see if we can quickly modify this uh, and ask that question. So I'm going to say uh, three element sequences. We can start here with three. We're going to uh, get the first element by i minus two. We'll get the second element by i minus 1. And uh, the third element will now be just i, because we're starting at 3. We can paste together the first, second, and third element. And when things are getting long like this, I like to just add spaces after the comma so we can so we don't run off the page. All right, let's try this. And let's look at the table. And now we can see there's eight possible outcomes. Uh, all of the ones that we talked about here, and the way this one's organized, it's they all start with H, and then go H, 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 T, T, H, T, T, and then all these ones start with T, H, 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 T, T, H, T, T. And let's divide by 10,000. So if there's eight possibilities, uh, what would, how would those happen with equal frequency? So what's one eighth? 12.5%. And we can see that these are happening roughly pretty close to 12.5%. We only did it 10,000 times, but if we went even longer, we would see these things average out to 12.5%. So we're seeing something about what randomness means here. And we're seeing that all of the possible combinations are happening with equal frequency. So if we take that subsequence up to four elements or five elements, you can imagine that the number of possible sequences increase. Um, mm. And you'll also find that the probability of each of them occurring happens with equal frequency, so which is kind of strange, especially when some of these subsequences get kind of long, because there's always going to be one that's all H's or all T's, and it will seem like that one uh, shouldn't be generated by a process where each of the elements should be 50%. However, don't forget that uh, even though those uh, seemingly unlikely sequences can happen, all the ones in the middle are also happening. Okay. 
The last concept here is the notion of subjective probability, which is discussed by Vilke and Allen. This is a Bayesian concept uh, where what you do is you assign a probability to a belief, and then you update your probability about that belief being true through a data gathering process. So I might say, like, I, I believe that um, tigers aren't purple, and I believe the probability of a tiger being purple is really low, like 0.0001%. I just, I just don't think there's a such thing as a purple tiger. However, I could imagine, you know, experiencing tigers and eventually if I saw a purple tiger, I'd have to take that new evidence and update my belief. I'd have to change the probability that I think I could see a purple tiger. So uh, we're talking generally about how it is you form a belief, assign a probability to it, and then use new data to change your mind. Uh, use that data to change the probability that you have. Now, this gets into a whole bunch of concepts that we're really going to gloss over in this DAS lab. But because we're doing a lab on probability, we're going to handle the concept of subjective probability in a very simple way and use a some R code to just sort of think about this one a little bit. Um, so, and by the way, we won't really be doing any uh, hardcore Bayesian stuff here. What we're going to do is we're going to create a sequence of events. We'll stick with coin flips. And what we want to do is create a series of events where the probability changes at some point of some outcome. And then we're going to see if we can um, measure those events and, and consider how we might update our beliefs about the world. So let's imagine that you've got something like this sequence here. And what I've done is I've created a sequence where the first 100 values, and we can just look at it. Here's the first 100 values. They're all zeros and ones. One represents a getting heads. So the first 100 values, there should be a 50% chance of getting a 1. However, in the final 100 values, there's a 60% chance of getting a 1. So if our uh, for the first 100 values, we've got a 50% chance of getting a 1. And then we increase that to 60%. So this is a true fact about this sequence that I made. That, and you can see it right here. The, the things that made the sequence had a 50% chance of one here and a 60% chance of one there. Now, of course, we know that. But what if all we knew wasn't this whole sequence? All we got was the data. That is, we, all we got was to observe what the first thing was. So the first thing was a zero. So let's say you see a zero. And then you see another zero. And then another zero. And you're just getting each of these one at a time. And every time you get a new piece of information, uh, your task is to use that information to form a belief about the sequence. OK. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to look at this little script and, and talk about this process of forming a probabilistic belief about this sequence. So I'm going to create two vectors. One of them is called my knowledge, and one of them is called my belief. And we're going to populate these vectors. They start off being empty. We're going to iterate through from one to the length of this simulated sequence. So that's our. this is our simulated sequence right here. There's 200 things in it. So one to the length of this will be one to 200, just like that. So I will take on the values one to 200. And we're going to start at the beginning. So let's, let's talk about what I'm doing in here. I'm going to say that the first step of the loop when I is one, so I'll just uh, 
put a I as one there. We're going to take a look at the value in that position of our simulated sequence. And so it was a zero. So we, we learned here that we got a tails. I'm going to save that in the my knowledge vector in that position. So as we go through this loop, my knowledge will systematically represent each of the flips that occurred in the simulated sequence. This is a process of evidence gathering. So I'm gathering new knowledge by observing the next thing that happened in the sequence. Now, um, I can, if I have all of that knowledge, I can summarize it for myself. I can compute the proportion of heads that I've seen in the sequence. And to do that, I can just, at every step, I can sum up how many ones there are in my, in my knowledge vector. And I can divide by the total number of observations that I've made. So let's do that. One, two, three, and just take a look at these two things. So my knowledge now has 200 things in it. It just represents each of the flips. And um, my belief is, uh, for example, look, it's a bunch of zeros at the beginning. I'm just plotting it here so we can take a look at it. If we look at the first um, few flips, look, one, two, three, four, five. The first five of them are all zeros. So that means that we didn't get any heads. And so if I asked myself, what's the proportion of heads that I've got the first five? It's zero. So my belief about this coin, about the proportion of heads that it has, uh, is likely to generate is, is stays at zero because I haven't seen any evidence that it can make a head. Right here, I see my first uh, coin flip that's a head. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's um, five out of six being tails. Or another way of putting it is one out of six was a heads. So I now have a new probability of getting heads based on my history, and that's 1.16 repeating. So that should be the very first number up here that is different from zero. And then what happens in the sequence is I get another heads. So now I've got two out of seven being heads, and the probability in my history goes up to 0 0.2857143. And this keeps happening. So I get another heads. So that'll be three out of eight. Um, so if I was a, a probability calculator based on my evidence, I'm, I'm going through a revision of my beliefs as I gather new evidence. And I begin believing this coin doesn't produce heads. I see that it starts producing heads. So I revise my belief about it by computing the probability of getting a heads over my sequence that I've experienced. And here's how my belief changes across the way. And um, now remember, so it does kind of get closer to 0.5. At some point, we... Uh, right here, we actually change the probability to a 0.6. And um, it's interesting to wonder about how, how you would actually detect these kinds of changes because um, there's a, a lot of revision going on or updating just to get to a particularly stable thing that's not changing. So these, remember these first hundred flips, the probability is 0.5, and uh, we're doing a lot of updating here. Um, I will say that for concept three, we're kind of just talking around this subjective probability issue as a sort of thought experiment. So the next part of that thought experiment is uh, what would your beliefs about the probability of getting heads look like if you only allow yourself to remember the last 20 coin flips? So this is like applying a forgetting function 
once you're, let's say you're, you're out here, you're starting to observe coin flips way out here, but you're only allowed to remember the last 20 of them. So you kind of forget what happened back here. Uh, we can simulate that in R. What I've done is basically just, we're gonna create another s simulation of uh, coin flips for the where the first 100 or 50 percent, the next 100 or 60 percent heads. I'm going to save all that stuff in uh, my knowledge vector as if I'm presenting the flips one at a time. And I'm going to calculate my belief that uh, about the probability of getting a heads. However, when I calculate this belief. I'm only going to do it uh, for the last 20 elements of my knowledge. So I'll kind of pr I'll forget whatever came before. Let's take a look at what happens there. So this is uh, pretty interesting uh, in that our estimate is now each of these dots is based on the last 20 flips. Okay, so as you can see, it kind of goes around all over the place. So right around here, we're saying, uh, based on the last 20 flips, I, I think this coin is like 80% heads. Even though we're still in the first 100 things, where it definitely hasn't switched up to being 60%. In this part of the sequence, the, the true probability is 60%. However, look, our belief actually goes down and up and down and up. And that's because we are computing this probability based on a small sample, which is just the last 20 things that we saw. So these raise uh, issues about how to think about probabilities from a subjective point of view certainly in terms of updating beliefs, but this illustrates uh, the basic idea behind the process where you're gathering data uh, and every time you do, you attempt to integrate the new data into the existing knowledge that you have and use that to um, provide a better estimate of the probabilities of the events that you're observing. And certainly, if we uh, were able to observe these things many, many, many times, uh, eventually the probabilities would settle out uh, to the true probabilities in the long run. All right, that's it for the concepts today. Uh, we're going to head over to do some generalization assignments, and I'll, I'll post those solution videos uh, uh, very soon. That's all for now.